All right. How's everybody doing today? Good? Well, uh, we are so grateful to have had the week that we did. You know, when I was a kid growing up, we did have vacation Bible school, but it was a lot different. I mean, we had, we didn't get the Oreos. We got the old cookies that came in a bag of about 100, you know, and the chocolate chip cookies that had the chocolate chips stamped on the cookie, okay? Uh, some of y'all don't know what that is, but it was, it was, uh, it was okay, and the watered-down Kool-Aid. This week, they had pizza, they had all kinds of healthy fruit. Anyway, they had a terrific group that helped with, with everything they did, learning the Bible, going through the, uh, the, um, the crafts. I know one night the kids uh, said, well, what do we do next? And somebody said, we're going to crafts. And one little boy said, yay! You know, that's great. I'm glad to see that going on. We're going through a series on uh, Nehemiah. We're in chapter 4. Today the title of this message is The Challenges to Rebuilding. Because whenever you go to rebuild something, there's going to be challenges. And uh, we're thinking not just of our church, but this community. There's a lot of restaurants that are kind of getting back up. I was talking to someone today who is working like a whole lot more than usual because they just don't have enough workers. And so at the time of rebuilding in our whole country, in fact, the world really, but we're talking about rebuilding in your families and in your lives. And we've been going through this story in the book of Nehemiah, and I'll kind of do an overview of where we are. Nehemiah lived in Persia. He'd grown up his whole life in this place in Persia. He was, lived in the palace. He got a letter from his brother saying that the, his homeland, the, the capital of his homeland was Jerusalem, and it was in terrible shape. They had rebuilt the temple, but there was no walls, and the city was in disarray, and uh, marauders kept coming in and, and doing things they shouldn't do, and so it was just in terrible shape. So he prayed about it first, and then he voiced a concern to the king, and uh, the king said, okay, what do you need? And he had practiced this kind of uh, thinking, anticipatory thinking, that had prepared him for that question. And when the king said, what do you need? He said, well, I need these provisions. I need protections. I need to be able to go and rebuild the walls. And so he gave him all he asked for. And so he went to rebuild the walls. Last week, we talked about how they did it. They divided into families, and each family took a separate section. I, I got to live in Jerusalem when I was working in graduate school, and the building that I lived in, the walls were part of the old wall, which was, it was fascinating to live there for a, for a month or two. And uh, so people built according to where their homes were. A lot of times, some of their homes were part of the wall itself that they were building. So he divided the families in that. Now we get to chapter 4. And in chapter 4, we're going to see that he goes through a whole lot of struggles. And they're surprises in many ways. I heard of a story one, one time where a mother came home from work and uh, the kids were in the back on the porch. And it was like six kids. And they all hovered around a box or, or something. She didn't know what they were around. And she came over and they were around there was a group of skunks, baby skunks, and they're all surrounded these baby skunks, and she saw them, and she said, oh, no, run, children, run, and each kid grabbed a skunk and ran off with it. <laughs> and it didn't turn out like she wanted, okay? Things don't always turn out like they want, and this, that's the way it happened in Jerusalem. We got a picture of what Jerusalem looked like. The walls, uh, I got a picture coming up, uh, what the walls looked like, um, it was about two and a half miles around the city. So if you have ever walked around Bush Gardens through all the countries, you know, all the different sections, there's a loop that you can get some great exercise. That's how far the wall was. The wall was thick. It was wide. It was high. It was about an eight foot thick. It was about 30 feet high, maybe more like 40 feet high. So this is a huge wall. And as they began it, they began it with great energy because this idea of rebuilding something that had been destroyed was exciting for them. Each family was taking care of a certain section because it was part of their home. And so they had a buy-in. And so they're all, they got it about halfway up and then 
they, they had a period of a loss of strength. Okay, beginning in verse 10. It says, meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out. And the word, um, the original words for this giving out is stumbling, tottering, staggering. Have you ever felt like that? You're giving out? Uh, maybe you feel like that today. I don't know. Some people feel like that. It's kind of like when you bought a new car, okay, and then after you had the car for about three years and the newness wears off, but the payments don't. And you feel that way. It's kind of like you're in um, Outer Banks and you decide you're going to walk to the pier and it's, you know, it's only a mile and then you get about a half a mile there and it looks like you've gone nowhere. And you're thinking, you know, this is close enough to the pier. They got a loss of strength. The work they were doing was hard work and they just felt like they were give out. Second, they had loss of vision. You know, the Bible says without vision the people perish. And what they could see in 410, it says there's so much rubble. That's what they saw. The destruction of what was there was overwhelming. Maybe kind of like it is after a, you know, what happened in New Orleans with the terrible destruction that was there or after a hurricane or something like that. And you look at the dirt and the stones and the dry chunks of mortar and you think, you know, how am I going to get through this? Maybe you're working not only your job, but somebody else's job. You know, there's several places in town, they would be open right now, except they don't have enough people to work. That's tough for those who are working. Maybe you're working in a job like that, and you see a lot of uh, your strength is gone, and the vision of what could be has been kind of sapped from you. They had a loss of confidence, okay? There was a, that they, they just didn't, they didn't think they could do it. If you don't think there you do it. it it really hurts you it says there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall this is the the whole group of jewish people were thinking this we just can't do it what would you do if you were the leader of this group and they hit you know that point where they just felt like they couldn't do it anymore i can't we can't get through it there was a, on top of all that there was a loss of security because they were surrounded by people that did not want them to succeed because they profited because there was no protection for the people who lived in Jerusalem and they could go in and steal from them and take their crops and stuff. And so in verse 11 it says, also our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we'll kill them and put it into the work. And so this is what the enemies were saying. I've got a... a Picture here, there were the Sanballat, that was the group of people against them, Tobiah, and there was the Ammonites, and then there was the men of Ashdod. All these people surrounded this area, this area where they were rebuilding, and did not want them to succeed. And then among their own people, among the Jews that had been living there, there was a loss of support. This might have been the worst of all. It says the Jews who lived near them came and told us, Ten times, not just once. You ever had somebody tell you bad news over and over and over again, and you think, okay, I know, I heard it already. Ten times over, wherever you turn, they're going to attack you. Wherever you turn, they're going to attack you. And so he had all these things going on with this group. They had a wall that was half-built. A half-built wall does not protect. In fact, in some ways, it was worse because when you had a mounds of rubble around you, at least there was something keeping people out. But now you cleared all the rubble out to build the new walls, and the walls aren't high enough to keep anybody out. And so they were at a low. But Nehemiah had a response. And I think today we need to have a response. We need to kind of hear from the Lord today in your life. I don't know what you're going through. Maybe you're going through some challenges like this. Maybe you've had some disappointments. Maybe somebody has said something that's discouraging to you and you feel like you're, you're spent. Nehemiah's response to this, he didn't just um, give him a pep talk. He did something. He did something about it. It says in verse 13, Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at, at the exposed places. So he took an action that made sense protect people he posted them by families with swords 
and spears and bows. So he posted people by family with their weapons ready, and he had it designed that way. And then after I looked things over for this two-and-a-half-mile span of a circle, after I looked things over, I stood up, I said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, he's encouraged them, he said, don't be afraid of them. Remember, the Lord who is great and awesome. So in your life today, you might be thinking, man, I'm worn out, how am I going to get through this? You need to encourage yourself in the Lord. God has a plan for your life. God can give you the strength to get through all things. Nehemiah encouraged them. He said, uh, who is great and awesome the Lord is, and fight for your families, your sons, and your daughters, and your wives, and your homes. And he said he reminded them what you're fighting for. It's not just for somebody else far away. This is for, you know, your families. And when our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated, you see, they found out that People knew what they were planning. And if you remember, uh, long before Nehemiah left, he'd asked the king for protection. So these people who lived in this area were under the authority of the Persians. So if they went against these people who had permission to rebuild this wall, they could get in trouble that way. And so perhaps a lot of their threats were kind of uh, not very effective anyway because they if they did something about it they could face the wrath of the persians and so nehemiah standing up to them he, he 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 had them all return to the wall each to their own work okay and the people got their mind right mind for working and from that day on half of my men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears shields bows and honor armor the officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held the weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword on his side as he worked, but the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me because he needed to be able to alert people when there, if there was a problem. And then I said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people. The work is extensive and spread out. It's a two and a half mile loop. We're widely separated from each other along the wall. If you hear the sound of the trumpet, come rally to us. Our God will fight for us. It's not just them. It's God that's fighting for them. It's not their wall. It's God's wall. And so we continue the work with half the men holding the spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. By the way, the stars don't come out till it's dark. <laughs> you know, it's not a nine to five job here. The stars don't come out until the sun is long gone. They worked long, you ever worked days like that? Long days. And after that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night. And so they were building the walls, staying in Jerusalem so that they can serve as guards by night and workers by day. Neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. I don't know what they smelled like, but it must not have been good. For days they worked. They sweated. They slept. They kept their clothes on, their weapons. Each had his weapon even when he went for water. Now, there was a verse in this section that I want to look at for a minute because I think it's fascinating. It's verse 17. It says, who, they were building the wall, and they carried materials, did their work with one hand, and held a weapon with the other. Now, in the original language, it's not just talking about work. It's talking specifically about an instrument. It's called a trowel. Uh, do you know what a trowel is? It's, it's used for laying brick, okay? And you, you take you, the, the cement or whatever it is you have, the material you're using, uh, um, and then you, you put it over it. Uh, I make pancake mix, and I tell you, if that spills on the, on the counter, it l becomes like concrete. So maybe it was like pancake mix. And you mix it up, and I don't know where that came from, and the, <laughs> the materials... And then they had a weapon, they had a sword in the other hand. And it's fascinating because um, years later, a great preacher in England, Spurgeon, he developed a, a, 
a newspaper that went out to really millions of people. It was called The Trowel and the Sword from this text. Because he thought that a Christian today ought to protect people as well as build something. Both of those together. I got a picture of a sword and a trowel. We're supposed to be having these available to us. We have to protect and we have to build. Picture somebody using a trowel. If you hadn't used a trowel before, you build. Do a lot of trowel work. And this week, by the way, a lot of volunteers did a lot of trowel work. I saw it. I was here. They'd show up early. They would set up for the kids. One, one lady, uh, she's a nurse. Okay, She works at a hospital. And she finished. And when we finish about 8.30 at night, I'm pretty whooped. Okay, I'm pretty whooped. And I looked at her. She said, well, i got to go. I said, okay, well, have a good night tonight. She said, well, I'm going to work. So she went from volunteering to work and working all night. And I thought, wow, there's a worker. There's somebody has a mind to work. She came every night. She volunteered. She helped out. Oh, the, the idea of doing trial work, if you're going to build anything, it takes effort. You just don't pray and say, you know, this is what they could have done. They could have said, well, the Lord's going to protect us. We're doing his work. So let's just don't worry about it. No, they prayed to the Lord, and they asked him to protect him, and then they got the sword out. They built with a mind to protect themselves as well. And so this idea of both the things coming together, that you, you, you build and protect, and I'm, I'm thinking here, what has God called you to build today in your life? What is it? And God's not calling us to build a wall like Nehemiah was. But there might be something that God's calling you to build. Maybe uh, he's calling to build and protect your marriage. Do you think that's important? Absolutely is. And this idea that, well, if it's right, everything should just work. You know, it takes input. It takes work. It takes, there's sometimes you're not going to feel like you first did when you first fell in love. And it takes work doing it. It takes protection. You know, you don't put yourself in situations where you could do things that you shouldn't do. And so you have to protect your marriage. You have to build it. You have to put safeguards in there so that, you know, you, you're not put in situations where you could do something that you shouldn't do, especially people who travel a lot. I think about people who work and travel all over the country. Gosh, it must be difficult. Travel to another country, and you might be thinking, well, nobody knows what happens here. Listen, God knows, and you know in your heart. Your spouse knows. So you have to build and protect your marriage. You've got to build and protect your kids. Do you think that's important? Gosh, that's such important. To build them, to try to put good things into them, and to protect them, because we live in a culture today that is not kid-friendly. It's just not. When I uh, was pastor of a church in Portsmouth, Virginia, and uh, I helped out with the Little League boys baseball team. I, I didn't coach, but I would show up, you know, and kind of help out. And so there was one day that uh, the, they had canceled practice and didn't get the word out in time. And so I showed up with my boys, and they said, there's no coaches today, nobody's practicing. Uh, but I asked the boys, you want to you want to throw the ball around? And they said, yeah, 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 Dad, let's do it. They've been looking forward to it all day. So I said, okay, let's do it. So we started throwing the ball. Some other kids showed up. They started throwing the ball around with us. And then I had parents start dropping off kids. And this one lady, I said, listen, ma'am, I'm not a coach. I'm just throwing the ball with my boys. She said, that's okay. I've got to go to the store. Take them. I'll be back in an hour and a half. And I got to thinking, they don't know who I am. They have no clue. I could have just showed up. I could have been anybody off the street. And here they're leaving their most valuable, you know, what they have with me. We have to protect our kids. This week, uh, one of the things that Ron has done all week, which is wonderful, Ron is the chairman of the security committee for our church. He has come to every day of VBS. He has walked around, made sure everybody is safe, made sure everything is going. He's not like a, 
a strict enforcer. He's just going around to make sure everything looks right. Make sure we don't have anybody here. What a blessing that is for the teachers, isn't it? You know, in fact, we all give him your hand. Thank you, Ron. We've got to build and protect our kids. We've got to build and protect our church. We really do. Because we don't have home court advantage in our country anymore. Used to be we did. Used to be in America, it, it started, I guess, one person wrote an, art, wrote an article recently that said that uh, if you were a Christian, you know, most people in the culture 20 years ago uh, were Christians, and then it became more of a neutral thing, okay, where it really wouldn't give favors or precedent to Christians or churches. Now it's, almost, it's the opposite. There's a negative vibe in our culture towards Christians and churches. Most of the time when it's portrayed on TV, it's in a negative light. Okay? And, and, and a lot of times we're competing. I talked to one of the kids this week. He said, yeah, I'm starting travel ball. He looked to be about eight years old. And he's starting travel ball. That means that he probably won't be available going to church for the next ten years. You know, you only have your kids for a certain amount of time. We've got to build and protect them. And our church, we need to build them, protect it to make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be winning people to Christ, seeing them grow and go out and be the people, be the salt. We are a salt shaker. That's what we are. And the salt doesn't stay in the shaker. It's shaked everywhere around town. And so God wants us to come together to worship him, to, to read his word, to be lifted up by it, be strengthened by it, and go out and be the salt to the world. And listen, three things, or maybe four things, I want to get out of this, this section of Scripture. First of all is this. When you do what is right, what's going to happen? There's going to be opposition. Even if you're doing something good, you can think, well, this is a good thing we're doing. Why does, it, why does the computer not work? You know, sometimes things don't work because we didn't do it right. But sometimes things go wrong and you think, why is opposition to that? Listen, these were Jews who came against Jews. In churches, sometimes we're all our worst enemies. We got people who are out there working hard and the other people saying, oh, it'll never work. It'll never work. Listen, you don't know till you try, Okay. You go out there and you do what you can, and you're going to be opposition, knowing that that opposition shouldn't be the deciding factor on what you do. Second, trusting in the Lord does not mean that you can't be planned and prepared. Those people trusted in the Lord, but they had their sword and the trowel while they worked. They prepared. And as a church, we are looking at how we're doing things. Right now, like a lot of churches, we're kind of in a rebuilding time. And some of our teams and committees, there's not everybody that's, that's working in them. And so we're looking at restructuring some of that. And that's not easy to do. But we've got a, a small group of deacons and myself have been working on that. We're going to take it to a, another, the whole group of deacons and review that. And we're working on making our church function at the highest level we can. Because God has ga ga given us a great um, gift in, in being in this area and being right here. And there's so many people that we need to reach of all ages. Third, there is strength in plan cooperation. To do it along with other people. Because basically, at the heart of what it means to be a human being is a lot of us are lazy. And we need encouragement. We need somebody else to come alongside us and say, hey, you can do it. Come on now. The Lord's calling us to do this. Let's do this together. And when I think of all the things that have to go in to, 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 to ministry for it to be successful, you know, it takes a, a work. It takes a, before I came here, I was a church planter, and we had a, a church that met uh, in a school, and basically we had to move everything in and move everything out every Sunday. A lot of work. But I, I think about all the, the folks that came to the Lord through that church, and it's such a rewarding experience for me to see that happen. And when we follow what the Lord has got for us, there's strength if we follow it together in planned cooperation. And for what's all through this text, all the chapters of Nehemiah is prayer. 
He bathed in prayer from the first calling he got by God to go and rebuild this wall. Think about who he was. He was a cupbearer. He was not skilled in leading people, but this whole book is about leadership. He became a great leader. I don't know what God's calling you to do. It doesn't matter your education. It doesn't matter how much money you got or where you live or all that. God may be calling you to do something incredibly difficult. It might be really rewarding, but don't think that you can't do it with God's strength. This was such a hard, you know, two and a half miles, eight foot wide, 30, 40 feet high, it was 39 feet high, with people who wanted to attack him at any moment. Nehemiah 6.15, the wall was completed on the 25th of Yuel in 52 days. They did it. 52 days. When all of our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. That is a, a good news story. And God wants to do that in your life and my life. He wants our families to be rebuilt. He wants our communities to be rebuilt. This country needs to be rebuilt on his word. We have fallen away so far from what we used to be. And we need to go back to God. And how do you do it? You do it one person at a time, one family at a time. You say, hey, we're going to take our stand. And with the help of God, we can become so much more than we think we can.